Before taking over his family library, Abdel Kader used to track down manuscripts for the Ahmed Baba Institute, yeah. seeking them out and persuading reluctant owners to hand over their treasures to the state for safekeeping. I went uh, to do some prospecting in a village called Bamba. The family led me down a corridor that led to a bedroom, and in the middle of the bedroom was a well. They opened the cover of the well, and with the help of a torch, we could see a pile of manuscripts. When we took them out, we found that about 60% of them were damaged, but the rest was good and they are now in Ahmed Baba Institute. At the height of its golden age in the mid-1500s, Timbuktu's population had grown to 100,000, and a good 25,000 of them comprised the city's community of scholars and their students. But if Timbuktu was once a town of 25,000 scholars, there's not much sign of it now. Frankly, Timbuktu today feels like a dusty, if elegant, backwater, a place that's been crumbling for centuries. Nevertheless, it's wonderful to think that behind any of these walls could be yet another cache of undiscovered manuscripts. Though there's already more than enough to ensure a rethink of the history of this part of Africa in a new and dramatic way. The Ahmed Baba Institute was born from the international conference organized by UNESCO in 1967. And the topic was the origins of African history. I repeat, the origins of African history. And what's the origins? Is the manuscripts. So with the Arabic manuscripts, the intention is to rewrite the history of Africa. Still, Future historians should be wary of dismissing existing African sources, including oral ones. The challenge lies in weighing all the sources against each other. African history have been, for a long time, uh, built on oral tradition. Of course, a lot of people think that oral tradition is not credible. But I, I think that it is an important source for African history. So the question is how you approach the source and how you criticize the source to write the history. A crucial source of evidence in any new appraisal of Africa's past are archaeological discoveries being made along the Niger near Timbuktu. The Niger has always been the lifeblood of this region, just as the Nile was to the eastern Sahara. Its waters provided fish and allowed agriculture to develop. The river was a long-distance trade route connecting the myriad communities along its banks. The Niger River rises in the hills of what was once the ancient kingdom of Futajalon, 150 miles from the West African coast. And but for a quirk of geology which caused the river to flow inland, the Niger would have been a very short river instead of one of the world's longest. Nearly 3,000 miles long, the river first flows north towards Timbuktu. It then curves eastward before turning southeast through Nigeria to the Atlantic Ocean. Between Jenne and Timbuktu, the Niger is yielding new revelations to equal the discovery of the manuscripts. From as early as 500 BC, this area was one of the most densely urbanized parts of the world rivaling other early urban civilizations such as Mesopotamia. Doug Park is part of an American team that over recent years has extensively surveyed the region's wealth of archaeological sites. When we met, Doug was about to begin excavating a huge city site 10 miles south of Timbuktu. So how typical is a site like this in Mali? How many might there be? Well, there, there is a lot. And there are accounts that say that if someone from Jenny wanted to uh, send a message to a village or a city a few hundred kilometers away, he just had to shout, and the message would be carried across the floodplains and, and uh, along the Niger until it reached that village. 
because so many people were living in There's such so many proximity. Yeah. So the picture at that time was just of it was of an urban landscape urban all landscape. across, all along the borders, exactly. the borders of the Niger River. Exactly. So read this landscape for me. Here, what you look for are these these gray these gray areas. Yeah, where it looks kind of earthy. That is this massive pottery carpet. It spreads around an area somewhere between 70 and 100 hectares. Which, which is, is enormous. It's massive. The city rivals the size of the great cities of Mesopotamia, like Ur or Uruk. Massive. So how does that compare to modern Timbuktu? Well, to the old Medina of Timbuktu, uh, it's maybe, um, maybe twice the size. And if you put that in comparison to the size of Timbuktu in regards to the rest of the world's cities during the Middle Ages, Timbuktu was somewhere around twice the size of London. Timbuktu is twice the size of London. And this site is twice the size of Timbuktu. Wow. One fascinating fact to emerge is that these people lived together peacefully for centuries. And now that looks very much like a skull. That is a skull. And what, what we can tell from it is that you know <clears throat> uh, it's probably not going to be uh, an Islamic burial because its head is facing south. So would he have definitely been in a grave? Yeah, um, he was you definitely You can tell he was grave. buried as opposed to well, fell there. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. What, Fed in battle, <laughs> Well, we, we, we don't really find any evidence for warfare uh, in West Africa during the, during the, uh, the pre-Islamic period. And um, we're not really quite sure why that is. It, peaceful society, we don't know. Uh, the, the general practice would have been is to bury the dead underneath the, the floor of the house. Oh, I see. It's granddad it, it, under the house. Yeah, good old granddad under the house. <laughs> Much of the pottery carpeting this site served the same purpose as our tin cans and plastic bags. Doug has described a cityscape whose architecture would have looked much like the villages still dotted around Timbuktu. It's just the density that's changed. It's amazing to learn that right here on this spot, there once existed a civilization 2,000 years ago as old as Christianity, um, the size of which rivaled modern Timbuktu over there. And in terms of its antiquity, Timbuktu and the manuscripts dating back to the 11th century are beginning to look relatively, well, modern. Archaeology has yet to tell us what happened to that civilization or about Timbuktu's early origins and how the town fitted into the bigger picture of a river lined with city-sized settlements. But Timbuktu's lively oral traditions tell the tale. Local legend has it, Tuareg tribesmen set up base camp here, around this well, a few miles inland from the mosquito-infested banks of the Niger River. While the Tuareg went off to graze their livestock in the desert after the rains, they left their belongings to be supervised by a slave woman, Buktu, the lady with the large navel. Hence, Timbuktu's name simply means Buktu's well. The Tuareg have been the main ethnic group to inhabit the Sahara for centuries. Their knowledge of the desert gave them control of the trade routes that ran from the north and east and led to the Niger. By the late 10th century, the most important and safest routes had focused on the region where the Niger bends eastwards. Timbuktu's creation was no accident, but a commercial necessity. They say that Timbuktu is where camel meets canoe, lying as it does between the Great Sahara Desert and the camel trains bringing the riches of the Mediterranean, and the river carrying gold from the fields of the south. The town was uniquely placed to flourish on trade. Camel trains from the north brought dates, European fabrics, glass, jewelry, tobacco, and salt from the Sahara. The boats from the south bring cereals, honey, shebata, gold, and slaves. What made Timbuktu an important place in the Middle Ages was the gold and slaves. 
c'est surtout l'or et les esclaves. It's said two-thirds of the world's gold came from Mali in the 14th century, much of it passing through Timbuktu. Today's markets are mostly a local affair, but camel trains do still arrive with the other mainstay of the city's historic wealth. Salt was the white gold of Timbuktu. From the mines in the north, it was brought down in great slabs by camel train to the town for transshipment on the river. International trade in Timbuktu often needed written contracts. That required the services of scribes and notaries, and they needed to work in a common language that bridged frontiers. <laughs> 